So you can imagine the eyes kind of like a camera. Many of the components of the eyes work very similar to how the camera works. So today I'm going to teach you the basics of how the eyes work to kind of act as a foundation that will help me explain topics of the eyes and vision in future videos. So the eye is a pretty amazing organ. There's so many things that the eyes do for us that we don't even have to think about it. We just look at something and it's there. So the only time that we really think about the eyes and how it works is when there's a problem. So when there's a blurry vision, a double vision, or maybe even a loss of vision or an injury to the eye. So today I want to show you how the eye works by combining two of my favorite passions. So let's focus on cameras in the eyes. Hi, I'm Dr. Shanai from True Focus Eye Care. Our goal at True Focus is to provide eye care and vision related education and advice to our patients, whether they're in our office or not. So if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, then consider subscribing by checking that little red button below so you don't miss any of our new videos. Have you ever heard the saying, one good analogy is worth three hours of discussion? Well, I love a good analogy because it helps me break down complex or unfamiliar topics, kind of like the eyes for my patients, and help them make sense of it using something that's a little more familiar. Now, if I'm unable to compare a complex subject to a simpler one, it reveals to me what pieces of that complex subject that I still haven't mastered. So in this video, I'm gonna quickly run through how the eyes kind of work in comparison to a camera. And that three hour discussion will probably be broken up into more videos going deeper into each one of those points. So the parts of the eye that I'm gonna to compare to a camera are the eyelids, the lens that brings things into focus, the muscles that move the eyes, the pupils, and of course the sensor or the retina. So the eyelids, it is the easiest one. We have eyes open and closed and open and closed. So the eyelids, just like the lens cap, is a protective shield that keeps outside debris and liquids from getting into the system. Next, I wanna talk about how our eyes move. So our eyes move by coordinated efforts by six different muscles in the eye. Now, these muscles are innervated or controlled by three different cranial nerves. Now, all that means is the eyes are amazing, but our eyes also have the ability to not just go up and down and side to side, but also has the ability to cyclo-rotate. And this almost acts as a image stabilizer for our eyes. So if we're walking or moving or we happen to sway, our eyes can also cyclo-rotate to counterbalance that so we're not so shaky in our view. If you've ever seen a video where someone who didn't have image stabilization built into their camera or with a gimbal, you'll notice that every single step that they try to take it just shakes the camera. So any movement of the hand can really make a shaky video. So when the camera moves, we're using our hands and sometimes a tripod that allows us to move the camera smoothly back and forth. Next, I wanna talk about the pupil. And in a camera, it's called the aperture. So the pupil in the front of the eye, I'm gonna move the cornea, is right here in the center of the iris. Uh, my kids think that pupil is an actual object, it's actually just a hole that allows the light to enter the eye to go into the back of the eye. So the camera also has a built-in pupil or iris inside of it, and it kind of looks like this. It can open and close just like the front of the eye. Now, depending on how much light we need into the camera, if it's a dark setting, I might want to make that pupil a little bit larger to bring in more light. And that's the same thing that our eyes do when we walk into a dark room. Those pupils expand, allowing us to see a little bit better in the dark. And then when we walk into a bright room, those pupils constrict and it blocks a lot of that light. If that didn't happen, we would look like a vampire walking out in the sun and we would hide for shade. So those with larger pupils tend to be a little bit more sensitive when they walk from a dark room to a bright room. So when we're in a bright setting like a soccer field or a baseball game, or even a building that's really bright, we rely on our pupils to constrict to make that light a little bit more comfortable. So the process of controlling how much light enters the camera is called exposure. So another aspect that the aperture or the pupil size controls is the depth of field. Now depth of field is how much space around the main subject is in focus. If you ever look at a landscape photo, everything seems to be into focus, so you have miles of focused 
subjects. Whereas in a macro shot, where you're gonna be taking a picture of something very close, like uh, a flower or an insect or maybe your dinner, uh, only millimeters could be in focus at that point. Now you'll notice in the manual settings of the camera, there's an adjustment that you can control called the f-stop number. Now how much you can adjust is based on the lens that you have, but that is what controls the depth of field uh, of that picture that you're taking. Now this number is determined by what's in focus and how large the aperture or the pupil of the camera is. So what does this do in our eyes and in a camera? Well, when we have a smaller aperture or a small pupil size, we have a greater depth of field. And conversely, when we have a larger pupil, we have a smaller depth of field. So this is why we might notice our vision seems to be a little worse in darker settings. Our pupils will be larger, causing a shallower depth of field. Now, if our eyes are not perfectly focused or our glasses prescription is maybe not up to date, then seeing those road signs becomes a lot more difficult as opposed to daytime when our pupils are smaller, giving us more leeway or a greater depth of field to see that sign. Now, this is why squinting seems to help uh, make things a little bit clearer. Now, that's not recommended though. So just like a camera has a lens to bring objects into focus, so do our eyes. And if our eyes are working properly, then we don't even have to think about it, it just happens. Now, I like to compare a camera lens, but more specifically a prime lens to our eyes when I'm talking to my patients about how we focus on near or distant details. So a prime lens is a lens that does not allow you to zoom in or out. If you wanna make an object bigger, you just walk closer to it. Now, when we were younger, we were able to focus on things that were inches away from our face as well as distant objects by the combined efforts of a crystalline lens and the muscle that surrounds that lens. Now, on a camera, what focuses the objects is the lens on the front and the hand that controls it. So I usually bring up this analogy when I'm talking to my patients who are noticing they're having difficulty reading up close or they're getting more dependent on their glasses or maybe they need more power to see. So what I'm always trying to explain is that it's usually not a problem with the muscles itself. If it is the muscles, then we have a whole nother conversation to talk about. Now with normal aging, that lens becomes less flexible, causing this muscle to try to move an immovable object. Now when we do that, especially over long periods of time, that's when we start noticing strain or headache and sometimes even uh, migraines and dizziness. Just like trying to turn a camera lens that is filled with dirt or grime over the years, you can not just ruin the lens, but possibly the whole camera. So our sensor is the retina. This is what captures all the light, which then sends the information out to our brain that interprets it. So with most digital camera nowadays, after the image is taken, we can edit the photo, crop out unnecessary parts of that photo to bring into focus the subject that we originally wanted to take a picture of using editing software on our phones or our computers. So that's exactly what our brains do for us. Depending on the context of the setting or environment that we're in, our brains will ignore certain things that are not necessary or considered essential uh, to bring into focus or bring into greater detail the subject in focus. Now the retina is a very complex part of the eye that I'm not going to be able to get too deep into in this video. But unlike a camera that I can decide precisely where I want to focus, our eyes can only focus in the center of our retina. And that area is called the macula, or more precisely, the fovea. So we must turn our eyes directly towards the subject of interest to see the detail. Whereas everything else in the field of vision is going to be blurry because it's only there for protection. Now I do go into more detail of the retina in an older video that I'll have that link in the description below. Now I could get creative and try to get into deeper, more complex stuff about vision, kind of like flicker fusion threshold or after image or motion parallax, but I'm not gonna get too deep into this because now we're starting to dive into the psychophysics of the eye. Shout out to Dr. Shallow Hoffman. But I think this provides a solid foundation that will help make more sense of other topics that we might discuss or tackle in the future. Now, even though I describe the eyes in hopefully a simple way, the eyes are far from simple. Many areas in the body can also affect the vision and can cause this whole system to malfunction. But this is why we should not overlook yearly eye exams and routine maintenance to keep the eyes running smoothly. Now, waiting till we actually notice a problem could not just affect our clarity, but also our life. 
So if you like this video, then please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss other videos like this one. And also make sure you click that little bell icon. Now don't forget, stay focused, stay well, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.